This is the English language section of Free Radio Europe, a European voice in your home. We've just had the NATO summit in Vilnius. Tragically, the war in Ukraine continues. We've had the Prigozhin mutiny. And politics is lively in the European Union, a general election in Poland this year and one in Britain next year. To discuss all of this and more, a very special guest, Mr. Edward Lucas. Welcome to the show. Jean Dobry, hello. Hello. Edward Lucas was uh, the recipient of, first of the first visa from Free Lithuania, then uh, a correspondent for the BBC, managing editor of the Baltic Independent, Moscow bureau chief of The Economist, and already in 2007 was warning us in his book, The New Cold War, about Putin and Putinism. He is now a candidate for the uh, Liberal Democratic uh, Party in Britain for the seat of cities of London and Westminster. Welcome again. Hello. Let's start with British politics. Has, how has glorious Brexit panned out in your judgment? Brexit's had a catastrophic effect on Britain. The um, estimates are that it's cost us about £100 billion um, pounds in GDP. Um, the British economy is probably 5% smaller than it would have been if we hadn't voted to leave. And so that means the less trade and investment, also less taxes being paid, worse public services, and we are really struggling to maintain the level of public spending that we need uh, with the uh, tax burden that's already very high and, and out of control borrowing. So that's a huge cost. I think there's also been a, a cost to our political system that it was very polarizing Brexit and each side, I think, conducted the discussion in a way that was not good for democracy. So the pro-Brexit people referred to the uh, um, Remainers as sort of quizlings, and the um, Remain people thought that the Brexiters were um, racist and stupid. And so that, let me stop that, here. So that you mean, still there. So you mean a part of the British political class has called another part of the political class as traitors because of a different view about the relationship with Europe, right? Yes, I mean, I was personally called a quizzling by a distinguished um, colleague who deals with Eastern Europe, a former foreign correspondent, a uh, friend, former friend of mine, um, who just said, you don't love this country. If you love this country, you'd want it to be an independent country and uh, you want it to be run from Brussels. And, but I also, I mean, I have to say, this is on both sides that I thought that the Remain campaign was run in a sort of smug and complacent way that exemplified uh, the way in which the haves and the insiders in British politics um, treat um, everybody else. And I was extremely angry with the way that the um, 2016 campaign was conducted and was also pretty angry with the way in which the um, campaign to overturn the referendum was conducted as well. So although I'm deeply upset about Brexit, I feel we are the authors of our own misfortune to a large extent. I'm trying to extract from you and from what happened in Britain a, a lesson on what is and might happen in Poland. So as I see it, there were fundamentally uh, many reasons for Brexit, but at the cutting edge, um, it was uh, a fanatical faction in the ruling party, which managed to bring the majority of its party to a pretty radical political stance on Europe. And number two, if you define sovereignty, independence, as legal autarky, in other words, you, you, you voluntarily sign up to treaties, and then when you're called upon to abide by them, you say you don't have to because independence, sovereignty, then exit is pretty much inevitable. Would you agree? Well, I would be very cautious about drawing direct comparisons between um, Poland and, and, and Britain on this. I do think that political polarization is, um, is bad and is, is co co corrodes democracy. I think that sovereignty is often misunderstood, that I mean, North Korea is obviously in a way extremely sovereign, mm -hmm. but it's not really a model for anyone else. And on the whole, in international politics, you get what you want um, best by doing deals with other countries and sticking to those deals. 
and there was a profound misapprehension, I think, in um, in in Britain, particularly on the Brexit side, that we were somehow run from Brussels, that these were unelected bureaucrats who were telling us what to do. And of course, to an extent, that's true. The Commission is not this elected. This sounds familiar, by the way. We have politicians yes. arguing that here too. <laughs> yes. And, and and what's left out of that is that you are um, at the table at the European Council um, making um, making the decisions that are then implemented by those bureaucrats, and you're also your lawmakers at the European Parliament um, scrutinising the legislation. So it's it's not really a case of the, what the Daily Mail used to call the Brussels diktat. On the other hand, yeah, I on do the think contrary, that... if I may interject, um, the European Parliament is directly democratically elected, and it has a role in passing directives. The Council is the democratically elected heads of government. And the commission consists of commissioners nominated by democratically elected governments. I don't know how much more democratic it could be. Well, in a way, I'm I'm rather sceptical. I know you're a European um, parliamentarian, and obviously, as a, a Remainer, um, I was very sad to see Britain not in the European Parliament. I'm not sure that the European Parliament actually gives the democratic legitimacy that it could do, because most people don't know who their MEPs are. The turnout is well, quite low. Problem, isn't it? In, in but Poland, I, I, Yes, but I, I but I, I I actually prefer the um, democratic legitimacy that comes from having heads of government who've actually won real elections, um, being at the European Council, and I would I think that the balance of power within the EU possibly. Um, shifted a bit too much in the direction of the European Parliament and away from the, the Council. I like the Council of Ministers because the people who are at the Council of Ministers have to go back and um, win a national election at the end. But that's that's a nuance, really. However, I do think that there is a gulf between the sort of people who understand the difference between the Council, um, the Commission and the Parliament and are sort of fluent in what one might call Eurospeak and a large slice of the population that isn't. And one of the reasons behind um, Brexit, I think, in, in, in Britain and possibly in Poland, is this feeling of a sort of democratic disconnect that they up there are talking about things that have an effect on me down here. And I don't, and, and no one's really respecting me. No one's having my say. Uh, I'm not getting my say. And you saw very... the people of Texas talk about Washington, right? I mean, the bigger the, uh, the polity, the, the greater the danger of the disconnect, right? Yes, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, there seems to be more, I think, I mean, one could test this, but there seems to be a bit more Euroscepticism in, in, and this sort of anti-establishment feeling in big countries than small ones. So I think if you're in a country like Estonia, a million people, everyone knows everyone, it's quite hard to imagine that it's run by a sort of out-of-touch elite establishment. But I do think that over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, we have failed um, as sort of decision makers and opinion formers in the big industrialised democracies to take advantage of the enormous sort of dividend that we great we, we gained in 1991 with the collapse of communism that com the cold war sort of kept us on honest and we were very worried about communism we had to um, keep our game very high in order to deal with it and i think there's a kind of laziness among the political class and taking things for granted which has given a lot of openings to the nigel farages and the donald trump's um, of this world and, and their well, counterparts. Nigel Farage has lost his account at Coots Bank, the millionaire's bank, huh? but he's still drawing a nice pension after serving uh, for 20 years in the European Parliament uh, denouncing European elites. Yes, but I think, you know, no, there's no rule that says you have to... Um, you know, if you if you d disagree with the European Parliament, you still get let you get elected there. Um, he was representing his constituents uh, there, and, and 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 quite effectively. But I think that the the, the big point is that we need a bit of um, self reflection on what one might call our side. Um, it's not enough just to say the other side are um, stupid, stupid and wrong. Um, if we had run things better in the nineties and the noughties, the the West would be in a better shape, both internally and externally. And we didn't do that. We had a big slice of the population which felt economically and politically left behind. And in a democracy, they can vote and they do vote and they vote for things that we don't like. And one of them was Brexit. But we also need an education about the European constitution. You know, when I lived in Britain, I was a Eurosceptic. I admit that because I read the British press and I believed what I read in it. And it was mostly rubbish.
Yes, and it, I mean, it doesn't. I mean, obviously, you know, tabloid um, papers will always go for easy targets, and um, people in Brussels with enormous expense accounts and uh, lifestyle that seems completely um, out of reach to most of the people they supposedly work for and represent are an easy target. So there's always going to be this kind of, you know, what about these fat cats? Um, having eating forbidden forbidden food like octopus um is very yeah the, 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 so, the, so that that's sort of an, an, an a normal part of 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 politics it's a it's silly and it's a little bit corrosive but you can um you can deal with that but i think the fundamental question is you've got to run your politics and your your economy um on an inclusive basis you've got to think about how is this going to not not just work for my voters um how is it going to work for the other lot as well because if the other lot take part and they feel excluded from the system then they'll break it when they come in and that's what we basically saw with brexit i agree um finishing on this um subject how important is brexit going to be in the british general election which is likely what next year right well this is a strange thing that the public now thinks brexit was a bad idea by roughly three to two, you know, perhaps more than 60% now regret it. Um, there's quite a clear majority to rejoin, although that's not really practical at the moment. And yet neither of the two major parties are talking about it. Uh, you have the um, the Conservatives insisting that Brexit is a success and the Sunday uplands are just around the corner and, wow, we have a new trade deal with New Zealand or South Korea or somewhere where we can, you know, just 0.001% of GDP will result, but they trumpet this. But the Labour Party is terrified of raising this because they want to win back those votes of the sort of the dispossessed, the people who voted for Brexit and then voted for Conservative because they wanted to get Brexit done. So the Conservative Party is is is, is owning the defeat um, or the disaster, but the Labour Party is not exploiting it. They won't, and um, Keir Starmer wrote in the Daily Express, which is perhaps our most, it's the, what is it, sort of Nash Jenik of, 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 of British politics, um, that uh, Labour was not going to question Brexit. It didn't want to go back into the single market, didn't want to go back into customs union. Now, that leaves a huge open space for the pro-European parties, one of which is mine, the Liberal Democrats, and I'm campaigning for us to try and take advantage of that. Um, it's, it's, it's rather odd. There's a lot of votes there on the table of pro-Europeans or, or um, regretful um, Brexiters, and no one's really speaking to them at the moment. And, and I think whoever can capture that vote will do well. Well, if there are uh, listeners and viewers uh, watching us from the city of Westminster, uh, I am very happy to, 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 to step out of my uh, uh, role here as an interviewer and say that Edward Lucas is the man who understands Europe and who will represent you very well in, uh, in, in, the, in the House of Commons. Uh, so if, well, if I had you, a vote in the city of Westminster, Edward Lucas would be my candidate. Well, thank you so much. And I, we, we actually have quite a lot of polls um, in our um, team and in among our supporters, and uh, we are very grateful. We always, always, always have more. Good luck with that. You were one of the early uh, critics of um, Vladimir Putin, and you were uh, perhaps more to the point, uh, 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 warning uh, the entire West about how dangerous this man is at a time when this was an outlier view. Uh, your book, as we've already mentioned, The New Cold War, was published already in 2007. There were others, but you were very prominent. And of course, you've been vindicated. Um, however, uh, as you know, uh, there were also some elements in Putin's policy that um, gave some people some hope that he may modernize Russia. He was very lucky in uh, coming uh, in the wake of Boris Yeltsin, who uh, uh, humiliated Russians, who uh, um, presided over the loss of both the external empire, the internal empire, uh, huge looting of property, huge disparities of wealth. He was initially seen as a man bringing stability, some uh, financial um, stability, uh, he was lucky in that the oil prices started to rise. And well, that's were... the point, really. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. J just if you rerun the last thirty years and imagine that Yeltsin had had Putin's oil price and Putin had had Yeltsin's oil price, you would have a very different story. I mean, oil was um, crashing down to single figures. 
um, five, six, seven, eight dollars a barrel at one point in the in, in the nineties, and that was catastrophic for Russia's finances. And Yeltsin, who made some terrible mistakes but also got some things right, um, paid a very heavy political price for the um, economic chaos. I wouldn't quite say that he, I don't think he deliberately set out to humiliate Russia, but it was a time of perceived humiliation for many Russians. Uh, and I think that Pu it's not antithetical to say that Putin wanted to modernize Russia, but he was also very bad news for us. And where I think many Westerners got it wrong was they assumed that a competent, efficient leader who didn't drink and turned up the office on time and wanted Russia to be um, have a strong state would be good for, uh, would be good for the West as well as Russia. And it wasn't. His, or he was briefly prime minister and he published a plan for modernizing Russia that impressed many people positively. It was, a, it was a pretty good plan to modernize Russia, not just narrowly in terms of military technologies, but broadly, soci uh, socially. Uh, uh, it, 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 he just didn't carry it out. Well, I think that, as you and I know from the Cold War, um, the at the heart of the sort of Soviet um, political doctrine is that you say one thing and do another. And the um, it was it certainly suited Putin in the uh, his brief time as prime minister and then when he was president um, to play on the um, very strong desire for stability and progress that Russians desperately wanted to catch up with the West and in that document that you you reference, he was saying we can get to the standard of living of, of Portugal um, by <clears throat> I forget when twenty ten something like that. But that provided cover. That provided cover for him to do some things that were very bad. Um, one of them was restoring the um, FSB's um, sort of reach inside Russian society and removing legal controls. Perhaps more important was clamping down on freedom of the press. And that was something I covered as the um, Moscow bureau chief of The Economist, that when I arrived in 1998, there was an extraordinarily diverse press. And there was a mixture of very high minded free publications. There were oligarch owned outlets, which often had you know, very slanted um, takes on the news. But you could turn on your telly on the Sunday night when the main current affairs show and you see a very wide range of different views. And from that, you could kind of make your mind up and work out what was going on. By the time I left, that had gone. And Putin was able to mask his uh, what was actually a, a kind of coup, an anti-constitutional coup, destroying the free speech legacy of Yeltsin by saying this is all necessary in the cause of stability and of modernization. For me, the early indications of his real values were the fact that he unveiled a plaque uh, in praise of Andropov on the Lubyanka uh, building of the old KGB and that he changed the school curricula to, uh, to uh, uh, reintroducing Tsarist and Soviet-type uh, chauvinist, imperialist version of Russian history. Yes, I think those came... I mean, I mean for a start, yes, he did um, unveil the plaque to Andropov. Um, he also, on the day of the Dien Chekistov, the day of the Czechists, he gave a sort of jokes, on, which is December the 15th, if my memory serves me right, he gave a speech saying mission accomplished. And this was, you know, having an ex-KGB guy running Russia as, as Andropov was, was um, quite sinister. Um, but he also laid flowers on Sakharov's grave, which people often forget. So I think he was playing to different audiences. Um, but the, um, the overall mission was um, this of the um, Gosodasvenik, the, the man of state, who wanted to get the state back and working properly. Now, the paradox is here that he hasn't actually made the state work properly. He's actually hollowed it out. Russia's institutions are in a really dire state. He's recreated, really, the Stalin-era Stavka high command and with a very tiny circle of, of advisors and very bad decisions being well, made. Stavka was just a military high command. Yes, and he's got that sort of Stavka. Um, you know, this is what Stalin had during during the war. Um, he, and he's he's got that, but for, for, for running all of Russia, not just the war in Ukraine. And so the, the, the all, all the institutions of Russia, the, you know, the Duma, the government, um, the different uh, um, legal and other constitutional agencies have all um, shriveled under his rule when uh, his his mandate at the beginning was I'm going to make Russia into a modern modern economy a country with strong institutions so he and hasn't the, actually done what, what he said the West, he and the West felt that it was the best policy to encourage him and he was briefly uh, a bona fide uh, 
uh, leader of Russia. Russia was admitted into the G7. He had a state visit in Britain. I was just recently watching uh, the pictures of uh, him with, the, with her, her, her Majesty the Queen, state visit in the United States. Um, uh, we were leaning over backwards to, to give him respect that he craved to encourage him in the right direction. Wasn't well, it was it? It was a terrible mistake, but I mean, it's, it's not a new mistake because we always indulge new leaders in the Kremlin. You know, we were wildly enthusiastic about um, Andropov when he came in and said, this is a man who likes jazz and John McCarry and he's going to modernise the Soviet Union. Remember we, all, we were wildly enthusiastic about Gorbachev, although I think uh, actually history will probably judge him much more harshly at the time. We were wildly enthusiastic about Yeltsin and then we were wildly enthusiastic about Putin. So, And I fear we'll be wildly enthusiastic about whoever comes next. But I think the real point is it's not about the personality of the leader. There's a fundamental misunderstanding in the West about what really happened in 1991. Yes, the planned economy collapsed. Yes, the Communist Party's political monopoly collapsed. But the idea of empire did not collapse. Um, and as Tim Garton Ash, our mutual friend in Oxford, points out, empires don't just vanish. They took a tremendous kicking in 89 to 91 with the loss of the Warsaw Pact and the breakup of the Soviet Union. But that basic imperialist idea did not go. And you were kind enough to reference my book, The New Cold War. There's actually a much better book written much earlier, which was called The Empire's New Clothes by Bruce Clark, written in 94, published in 95. And he highlighted right back then the Russian imperialism, the cult of victory, the obsession about the Second World War, um, the anti-Westernism, and all the different elements which we now see in the Putin era. And this is when Putin was still a humble, corrupt official in St. Petersburg. And I'd also point out that the then Estonian president, Lennart Meri, gave a brilliant speech in Hamburg in 1994, December 94, um, highlighting Russia's trajectory towards aggression abroad and repression at home. And of course, he was widely um, mocked, as indeed were many other politicians and um, countries that know Russia well. And they were told, you're exaggerating. But actually, the, the, the signs were there. And I was lucky enough to be um, one of the people who saw it early. And it took me till 2008 to get into a book. But it was all there in the 1990s before Putin. And I suspect it will continue after Putin as well. Sure. And there was the war in Chechnya provoked. Two wars. And there was the, the uh, one under Yeltsin, one under Putin. Um, and, uh, and the blowing up of the apartment blocks and the uh, assassination of journalists. Uh, we've known all that. But we also saw some um, pointers in the other direction. So, for example, Russia was uh, negotiating a partnership co and cooperation agreement, uh, an association agreement in, in, by another name with the European Union, and was actually making some political concessions in order to get it. So, for example, at the uh, EU-Russia summit in Samara, um, uh, uh, Germany told Russia, if you want this agreement, fix your relationship with Poland. And Putin did make some efforts uh, to fix the relationship in Poland. He came to Gdańsk for the anniversary of the um, uh, Second World War. That was acknowledgement that uh, Stalinist uh, uh, version of history of the Great Patriotic War starting only in 1941 was not the only way to look at it. Putin was the first uh, leader of Russia to come to Katyn on the 7th of uh, April uh, 2010. During one of my visits to Moscow, I learned um, uh, at Butovo, this uh, NKVD, uh, KGB um, exercise grounds where the majority of uh, the Russian uh, Orthodox priests were murdered by Stalin, that Putin was a, a fairly frequent visitor there. Um, there, were, there, were, there were grounds to see that Putin may be on some kind of very broad convergence course with the West, at least economically. And then what would you say of the following hypothesis that what finally uh, tipped the balance for him and he turned decisively against the West, dropped uh, remaining pretenses uh, uh, as a result of the Arab Spring. Uh, and when, then when he saw what uh, he saw as a Western betrayal of M Mubarak and um, 
the bombing of Libya and the hounding down of uh, uh, Gaddafi. He then saw the large scale demonstrations in Moscow and St. Petersburg against his returning to the Kremlin as president, which he blamed personally on Hillary Clinton. And it was at that point that he said, right, they're trying to get me. Uh, I am going to create a rival pole of integration around Russia with Kazakhstan, with Belarus, with Armenia, and Ukraine is an essential part of that. Before that, he is on tape with Barroso and others saying Ukraine may go its own way. After that, he was willing to pay both a financial and, as it turns out, uh, uh, invasion price to, 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 gain, uh, to regain Ukraine. Well, um, you raise enough material in that question for us to have a, a couple of days seminar. Um, but I, I, mean, I, I think I I've probably disagree with you, really, about Putin's motives. And I think that he was happy to have good economic ties with the West because he needed that for the um, uh, strengthening of the Russian economy. And that was good for him and good for his image at home, which he obviously cares about. Uh, I think that he never accepted that this would come at the cost of real political concessions. He was willing to make some sort of symbolic gestures, not just towards you um, in Poland, but also towards the Czechs on the anniversary of um, 1968 and towards the Hungarians, first of all. On he lived the, at the, uh, the agricultural embargo in Poland in 2007. Yes. So, And, and I think it was, and what to me, um, that, I mean, I, we'll make a little detour to Samara. Um, what really struck me about that was that um, Angela Merkel said to him in um, language which I wouldn't want to use on your radio station, um, and she said this to him in Russian, if you screw with um, Poland, you screw with the EU, and if you screw with the EU, you screw with Germany. And Putin was baffled by this because he couldn't understand why the Poles, who, uh, the Germans, who he regards as serious people, um, were sticking up for the Poles, who he regards as untermenschen, um, to use the German term. And so that was a bit of a shock to him. And so it showed to me that when the EU was willing to pay hardball with Putin, which Schroeder had not been willing to do in the, in the Schroeder era, that that was, a, that was a win for Merkel. But I think that fundamentally, um, Putin was not willing to, was, was never willing to accept that um, the, uh, there was a political price um, in terms of democracy and freedom in Russia and real dissent and real contestation of his, of his, of his rule um, that would come with the good economic ties of the West. He wanted you know, to sell lots of gas and to have lots of Western investment and to have um, market access and so on. He liked all that and the wages and prices and the wages and tax revenues and so on that came with it. That was all fine. If that meant that he actually had to run the country as a proper, um, with with a rule of law and democracy. That was way too far. Yeah, I, and, I, I, and I think, I, that, I, and, I, and I think the, the cynicism, um, you know, so, so you, we, we have to accept there's a sort of cynical agenda there. And to some extent, one should, um, you know, one, one tries to play, um, you know, game on what points one can. I, I actually think we went way too far um, with Putin and treating him as a, as a, as a, a serious, um, political and diplomatic interlocutor. We had, we were to some extent, we, we were in a difficult position because we had Afghanistan going on, and we needed the northern route to Afghanistan. And sometimes in politics, you have to deal with let's bad people. Remember, let's remember why Putin was at the NATO Bucharest summit in two thousand and eight, where he made that uh, uh, aggressive speech about Ukraine. He was there as a member of the Afghan Afghanistan coalition. Correct. And so, so I mean, but, but I mean, I, I mean, I criticised you publicly for this at the time. Um, that doesn't mean that we actually treat Russia as a friend. And so, I think, for example, inviting Lavrov to speak to your ambassadors' conference was a, was an error, in retrospect. And I wrote about that. I think that the reset, the American reset, was an error. Tell, tell me uh, what Poland lost by that. I think you 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 lose a. Uh, a, an important moral category between um, countries that are actually friends and countries you're having to deal with. We and, had the deputy prime minister of communist Vietnam as well. A yes, and uh, our ambassadors gave Lavrov a, a real good grilling. Um, yes, well, look, I, I can see the argument in favour. I mean, I can see the arguments in favour. I'm not saying it was a foolish decision, but I think in retrospect, um, we overdid it with Putin. 
and so, I from, and, and from I, our point of view, uh, we had a, a period of of a thaw with with Russia, never having any illusions about the nature of the beast, and you know that. Yes. Um, well, I, we I did. Uh, well, you... uh, let me finish the sentence. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a a group on difficult issues, which, for example, tasked Polish and Russian historians to cover the so-called white patches of history. And they produced a big tome uh, dealing with, with those very difficult historical issues. And the leader of the Polish side of the group told me, Professor Rothfeld told me, look, if I black out the uh, names of the authors, you will not be able to tell which essays were written by Poles and which were written by Russians. So we established the facts of history. That's important. This is irrelevant right now, but it will become useful one day. That's not nothing. We had a, a, a statement of reconciliation by the churches modeled on the Polish-German reconciliation. Uh, we had uh, a local border traffic agreement whereby the most anti-Putinist part of Russia, the Kaliningrad exclave, uh, and by the way, I started calling it the Krulevets uh, exclave, um, was able to, uh, to, uh, to travel to Poland. Um, uh, we were uh, encouraging Russia's modernization while all along having a plan B, spending solid 2% of GDP on defense, warning allies about uh, Sevastopol, about Crimea. I, had, I put the only EU uh, consulate uh, in Crimea, getting uh, contingency plans for the defense of Eastern Europe, getting signing up to the American um, missile defense base, and, the and we got the first presence of US troops on our, our soil. Um, and I put to you that if there is a change of leadership uh, in Russia, we will have to go back to something like that again, encouraging on the one hand and preparing for the possibility that, for the likelihood that it might not work uh, just in case. Well, I'm delighted you had the plan B and the plan B was um, worked much better um, you know, in, in, in retrospect than the plan A. I think there's. No, but there look, are some... others didn't have a plan B. Germany didn't have a plan B. I agree. I'm not. I'm. I'm not defending. I'm not defending Germany. And I. And I. I commend you for having had a plan B. And uh, and there were other countries that also had plan B, and many others that didn't. But I think that there's. Uh, there's. I mean, to take one small case, um, I think that we could have done. There were some very important anti-Putin protests in Kaliningrad. Um, which didn't get the support from the West that they could have done because we were being nice to Putin. Um, that's one thing that sticks in my memory. But I think in the end, you, you, you've got you've got you've got your um, you, uh, some 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 deals with Putin. They have no. Um, it, it turned out that Putin was able to tear them up again, and so we see Katyn denialism, which I highlight, which was just beginning to creep back in I think two thousand six. It was the first article in Nezavisma Gazeta. On, on raising the sort of um, Soviet lie, lie about Katyn. Actually, um, actually, no, you, let you, me stop you, because you may actually not know about this. Before the financial crisis in 2007, the Russians were talking about a multi-billion, creating a multi-billion dollar fund to compensate the families of Katyn victims. Yes, well, let, let me just get my, um, I've got the reference here on my, so I think I think you're, you're right that the, um, that you, you nailed the sort of first iteration of Katyn denialism, and that was good. Um, um, but And also remember um, that after the Smolensk air crash, uh, the, the movie Katyn was shown on... Yes, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not disputing that, really. I, I say you, 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 I mean, at a time when things were going wrong on Katyn, um, you were able to, um, you were, you, you were able to, to, to push the, Russians in the right direction, and that was good. Um, but unfortunately, it's now back again. So cool. although you, you, these these concessions, um, you, you banked them at the time, but they've they've evaporated since. Now you raise a very important question about what happens after Putin, and I I'm concerned about this because I think that there's a a, a bit of wishful thinking in the West, um, which is that um, when when Putin goes, things are going to be okay. I think that's rather unlikely. I think it's much more likely that we either get Putin 2.0, so someone else doing something pretty similar, 
or we get someone a lot worse, a sort of Prigozhin, full-on fascist type. Or well, most exactly. like, most I likely, mean, hang on, but, but I, I just didn't finish. Or most likely, I think we get a Smutnoy Vremi, a time of troubles, where, like we had in 1598, um, a time the Poles remember well because they got to Moscow then, um, with uh, with a, we um, was it, six for burning, for burning down Moscow. I'm sure they were glad about that. But you've got six Tsars in 13 years, and I think that the the, the, the real question for the, for the West is how we handle um, political chaos and uncertainty post Putin with all the dangers that that implies, not just of loose nukes and refugees, but also that the big Western countries are so keen on stability that they start trading your interests for it. And I've talked just quite recently to some Germans about this. And they said that our absolute priority is stability. And, and if the um, new leadership in Moscow is worried, we will try and help them. And I said, well, what's that help going to invo involve? It will be questions about NATO's posture in Eastern Europe, where the Russians will say, watch out, that's very provocative don't put you know, nuclear weapons in Poland. It'll be about security guarantees for Ukraine. Don't put um, you know, Western troops in Ukraine. It'll be about reparations and war crimes pressure. And they'll say, back off, give us some space. If you don't help us, you'll get the bad guys. And I see a big split looming here where um, West European countries are going to say, we'll have to accommodate the new leadership in Moscow for fear of finding something worse. And the Easterners are going to say, hang on, you're trading secure, your, our security for your stability. And I'd be interested to know what you think about that. Well, that's why I find, I, I think we should encourage the discussion that's taking place among Russian opposition and hope that it will seep into a discussion within the Russian elite about the end of empire. Uh, when Khodorkovsky, uh, um, Kasparov and others say that uh, uh, empire is bad for Russia, that Ukraine's border, borders have to be restored in the internationally recognized shape and that Russia needs to pay reparations from future oil and gas revenues. That's good. That today may seem uh, irrelevant, but, you know, in our part of the world in particular, exiles sometimes uh, become the government. Um, Indeed. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, the, the number one um, condition for the new Russian leadership has to be uh, giving up uh, the empire. And I see the G7 statement from Vilnius uh, day before yesterday as going in that direction, saying yes. we will only uh, uh, um, restore your access to your central bank reserves when you have first paid reparations to Ukraine. Good. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think I, I, I'm, I'm delighted with the stance we take now. Um, I just hope we stick with it. Um, I agree with you very much that the, the, the key for Russia is to stop being an empire and start being a normal country. And I was delighted to take part in a conference in um, the European Parliament, um, organised by some of your Polish um, colleagues, although not from your party, about um, post, post when I, I, I In rival, in rival uh, European groupings, as yes. you know. Yes, I know, but, but it, was, it was very good to raise this. I'm not sure that I endorse um, everything that was said there, but need to be discussing what happens next is really important. And I think the Prigozhin escapade was a real wake-up call to people in the West who are not doing contingency planning about post-Putin. Um, now, I don't think that Russia will break up on the ter sort of territorial and ethnic and linguistic lines that the, um, the, the Soviet Union did, because the contours are rather different. I think it's more likely it'll be um, a sort of feuding economic clans, which may dress themselves up in, um, in, in, in sort of political or ethnic colours. But we need to talk about this. And I, I'm, I'm very um, worried by the sort of groupthink and complacency in many Western capitals, in many Western foreign ministries, who just don't want to think outside the box when it comes to the future of Russia. And I'll tell you more, a, a Russia that dropped the empire, that recognised that uh, international borders are there to stay forever, and that uh, restarted its modernization uh, w would become a player in our uh, rivalry, Western rivalry with China, with all kinds of possibilities. Yes, I think there's also a danger that, um, that I mean, the, the, the main result of the war so far is that Russia is a lot weaker and it's weaker um, in, relative to China, which is that thus relatively stronger. And it may well be that paradoxically at the end of this is that, um, China, that Russia becomes a sort of resource colony for 
um, for, 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 for China, which will not be desirable from our point of view, although I don't think there's anything we can do to stop it, nor, nor, nor should we try, try to. But I just want to just um, come back to you on Katyn, that in the 8th of September 2007, in Rasiska Gazeta, which is the Russian government newspaper, there was a commentary by Alexander Sabov, which blamed the um, Katyn massacre on the Germans. And that was the first bit of Katyn denialism, which came out in um, official Russian media, and it was a huge switch that you got. We went from that to having Katyn screened on Russian television. Um, Not after only this, that, uh, we yeah. had a unanimous uh, condemnation of the massacre and rehabilitation of the victims by a vote of the Duma. And we, we know how democratic the Duma was, but still, that was a, a huge political act. That was it. Uh, which which year? Which year was that? must have been 2008, I think, thereabouts. But it happened, you know, and it's not nothing. I mean, it took some political capital. Um, uh, going back to... Um, to, it, was to 2000, it was 2010. It was 2010. So oh, you yeah. went for, so in three years you went from having a Russian government newspaper saying that cutting was done by the Germans through to the Duma condemning it. And that's, a, that, that, that's quite some shift. All right. So that, you know, that was one of that, the things that, that, that the, the attempt at normalization achieved. Um, but going back to the future, uh, I think uh, China is taking over the Russian market as regards manufactured goods. It is taking over the Russian market as regards the cyber domain. You know, the Russians now have Chinese apps on their smartphones. I think China uh, will want to buy Russia's gold reserves. And then it would only take a judgment by Xi Jinping that instead of risking a world war by taking over Taiwan, he could burnish his place in history and make China great again by recovering another lost province, which, by the way, the Russians now, the Chinese again, uh, refer to by, the, by its Chinese name, Han Shenwei, um, Vladivostok, and Outer Manchuria, which was only lost to China very late as a result of the Second Opium War uh, in 1860. Russia's uh, weakness invites uh, uh, Chinese revisionism. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And I um, I think that the Chinese must be looking at this and making their lips. I mean, although they don't like the disruption, they don't like the spikes in food, fuel and fertilizer prices. And they have told Putin very sternly to stop all this talk about um, nuclear weapons because they don't like that. They have a very different nuclear doctrine to, to Russia, a much stricter and more purist one. Um, I think they, they've, they've gained... Um, Already, they've gained um, a role as a sort of global mediator um, by this slightly flimsy peace plan they've put forward, um, which well, comes on the he uh, comes on the heels of the Saudi Iranian um, deal, which they really did broker. But yeah, for the first time ever, China is now a sort of European security actor, if yeah, perhaps not not terribly serious one, but at least um, in the eyes of the world, they're there in European security. And we, when we go to Beijing, our leaders go to Beijing, they go as demandeurs, um, you know, asking Xi Jinping to you know, calm down Putin. So they've got some le leverage on that. And then there's the second shoe, um, which is that at the end of the war, um, Ru Russia is probably going to be in a miserable state with China as its only friend and, relative, as I said earlier, relatively weak in relation to China. And China will extract concessions from that. Let's end by, I think, agreeing that everything that positive that can happen in this sorry saga, namely uh, the restoration of Western morale, the restoration of Ukrainian freedom, uh, the restoration of or, or the creation of Russia as a normal post-imperial state, uh, perhaps the drawing of Russia back to, towards some kind of uh, 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 normalization with the West. It all hinges on one thing. Ukraine needs to win this war. Absolutely. And I think I mean, the thing that is so frustrating here is that Ukraine is fighting and dying, not just for its own freedom, but for ours. Um, Poles realise this, and Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians do, but a lot of Europeans and Americans don't. The second point is they are fighting and dying in large numbers and losing you know, lives and limbs and, 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 and devastating their country. 
chiefly because we have been so slow in sending weapons. And the most frustrating aspect of this is you, you see it again and again. Ukraine asks for weapon X. We say we can't it'll provoke Russia. Then we think about it more. Then we say, well, maybe. And then they go and, you know, and, and eventually the, the weapons go. And then the Ukrainians are trained to use them and they use them. It makes a difference. And we've seen that with tanks. We've seen it with anti-aircraft missiles. We've seen it with um, the air defense systems. We're seeing it with in the meantime, systems. the Russians have built a defensive line, which is yeah. quite, so, quite and, and, and then we have the arrogance and the astonishing arrogance to say to the Ukrainians, please can you hurry up and win, we're getting bored. And by the way, please be more grateful. And I think that's really galling. And I exclude Poland from this criticism completely. I don't think that this is, but it is, um, yeah, we heard it at the um, NATO, NATO summit. And yet there's a paradox here, um, because although I find these criticisms extremely um, annoying, yet if we are going to sustain the support for Ukraine, then we need to have on our side people who we don't like and we don't agree with. And that means reaching out to left wing Democrats who think that the war's got up by the you know, imperialist warmongering and the right wing, um, the Trumpian Republicans who think that Ukraine is a sort of um, outstation of the Biden um, conglomerate and that uh, foreign entanglements are bad anyway. It means talking to sort of pacifist Germans. It means talking to large slices of the French political spectrum on the left and right and, and many other pe pe people besides who don't see things our way. And so on, on the one hand, we should be, it's, it's outrageous. We expect the Ukrainians to do more. And yet we have to say to them, guys, we've got to make the case better because um, elections are coming and um, we can't be sure that the same political constellation that's helped you so far is going to be there in the future. Um, so you and I are going to be very busy with this in the weeks and months ahead. Edward, thank you very much for your time. We need to win. We need to win in Ukraine. We need to win in Poland. And we need to win in the city of Westminster. Slava Ukraine. <laughs> Gero Slava. Thank, thank you, you so for much. the conversation. This well, has been the English question. language section of Free Radio Europe. If you've enjoyed it, please share and uh, subscribe to my uh, channel on YouTube. Thank you very much. See you next time.